All right, Stuart Ince, let's take a look at Notes 4.2, Biodiversity. These slides will help you understand the scope of biodiversity on Earth and ways of measuring it. Biodiversity, again, is the sum of an area's organisms, considering the diversity of species, their genes, their populations, and their communities. There is no one exact definition of biodiversity. People have conceived of it in many ways. So, components of biodiversity. It can occur at several different levels. We can have ecosystem diversity, where we have many different types of ecosystems, wetlands, forests, uh, mountainous regions. Within one of those regions, within one of those ecosystems, we can have species diversity. And this is usually what we think of when we say biodiversity. We mean a large number of different species. In any one given species, we can have genetic diversity. This would be differences in the genes within that one species, so that not all frogs are identical twins. Species means a particular type of organism, a population or a group of populations whose members share certain characteristics and can freely breed with one another and produce fertile offspring. Species diversity means the number of variety of species in a particular region. We can think of this in two ways. Species richness, meaning the number of species, and species evenness, also called relative abundance, meaning how evenly is each species represented. A little FYI, um, I'm not going to quiz you on this part here or test you on it, but this is how we structure um, our characteristics. This is how we characterize or categorize life by domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You may have learned this in life science in junior high. Genus and species are usually the names that we see. For example, Homo sapiens is the genus Homo and the species sapiens. For a tiger, uh, it's the genus Panthera, and the species is Panthera tigris. So, let's take a look at the next one here. You can also have subspecies. Here, we can see that there are, um, there are eight different subspecies. Well, let's read this. Within species, diversity exists in subspecies or geographic variations. The tiger, Panthera tigris, has had eight subspecies. You can think of this as eight different races of species um, or of tiger. And five persist today, meaning that three have become extinct. And so those five are the Bengal tiger, Sumatran tiger, Indochina, South China, and Siberian tiger. And as you can see here, the Bali tiger, the Javan tiger, and the Caspian tiger are extinct. By genetic diversity, this includes the differences in DNA composition among individuals within a given species. So just like how there's a variation in hair color among humans, there are also subtle and not so subtle variations within our, our biochemistry, you know, the type of uh, the immune system and all the complexity of all the biochemistry happening in our bodies. So it's good that we have variation in, say, immune systems, because that way one virus that's particularly deadly to some types of individuals won't kill off the entire race if we all had that same um, immune system exactly. We see that a lot with crops. When you grow a single, um, a single species of crop where all the plants are very similar to each other, you could have, a, you could have a, a fungus or some kind of mold or whatnot come through and wipe out an entire field if, the, if all the wheat plants are too similar to each other genetically. So it's good to have diversity, and we'll talk more about that as we um, in our later units. Okay, so adaptation to particular environmental conditions may weed out genetic variants that are not successful. So that's kind of what I was saying here. We don't want all species to have exactly the same genes because if one is not successful, it means they're all not being successful, and that species will go extinct. And by successful, we just mean able to survive and reproduce um, and have offspring. But populations benefit from some genetic diversity so as to avoid inbreeding problems or disease epidemics. So we did mention inbreeding problems that um, within our genes we carry recessive genes that don't actually manifest themselves unless we had um, unless we had offspring with another person who shared that same recessive trait as we do. It's possible that our offspring could get both copies of that recessive trait and actually now display the trait. 
some of those traits can be very serious too and can um, can make it difficult for that organism to be successful. All right, little FYI here. What is the variety of life on the planet? Planet-wide, we see that there are many, many insects. So this is this drawing is showing um, the number of species within uh, each category by the size. So insects is the biggest. There are the most number of species of those. And arachnids, pretty large. Protists, you know, such as algae. And lots of different types of roundworms and annelids. Where's humans? Oh, I'm sorry, where are mammals? Ah, the left below the arachnids. So here are mammals. Relatively small number of species worldwide. So what can we say about this? Insects comprise more than half of all species in the world. Beetles comprise fully 40% of all insects. And mammals are outnumbered by spiders and their relatives 16 to 1. So there's another way of looking at diversity. As we understand and as we study the environment more, and keep in mind environmental science is still a relatively new field, not, not much more than about 50, 50 years or so. As we begin to study it, we see more the importance of also recognizing ecosystem diversity. It is diversity within an ecosystem that leads to diversity among communities and habitats, and ultimately diversity among, um, among the species. In other words, if you have a variety of different ecosystems, you're going to have a greater variety of species. So when we talk about ecosystem, we're talking about the landscape, the type of habitats that exist in that landscape, and the type of interactions that occur within the communities of that ecosystem. For measuring biodiversity, we're still pretty profoundly ignorant of the number of species that live on our planet. We know that there are about 1.7 to 2 million species that have been formally described by science, but many more exist. Estimates range from 3 million to 10 to 100 million. So we really only know a few percent of the species that we think are out there. And by species, we even mean you know various types of microorganisms, um, micro microorganisms in soil, let alone all the different microorganisms that exist in the ocean and how much of the ocean have we explored? Just a very small percent. Why are we so unsure of these? Some areas remain little explored, like the ocean, especially hydrothermal vents, uh, rainforest canopies, um, tropical soils. And by, by rainforest canopy, we mean the different layers of all the vegetation in the rainforest. Tropical soils and the different types of microorganisms they harbor. Many species are tiny and inconspicuous. Microbes, roundworms, protists, fungi, etc. These can all be microscopic. Some species are very similar in appearance. Microbes, fungi, small insects, taxa, even trees, birds, and whales. Uh, it can be difficult sometimes to distinguish what it, whether two trees are actually of different species or not. And here's a, here's a nice graphic. All life, 75% of it animals, 15% plants. Then we have our 5% protists, 4% fungi, bacteria, and arachnia. And I, this is by number of known species. Then within the animals, we can break it down to uh, mostly known insect species. And you can see vertebrates here, a very small percentage. And then of all the vertebrates, fishes, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals. This is a point, a point that you do need to know, distribution of biodiversity. So another pattern in the uneven distribution of biodiversity is the latitudinal gradient. Species richness increases toward the equator. If you take a look at this uh, boreal forest in the, um, in the northern part of North America, three to 100 bird species. If you take a look at an equatorial zone, 500 to 700 bird species in only a very small area compared to the very large Arctic area. So we can relate this to niche. Ecologists are not certain why the latitudinal, latitudinal gradient exists, but one idea is that tropical climates encourage specialist species that can pack tightly in the community. So in our temperate polar area, we have many generalists who are sharing, they have large niches. As you can see, sometimes these niche, niches overlap, so you would get some kind of resource partitioning happening. In the tropics, we tend to see smaller niches where a particular species might only need a very small, narrow 
um, type of conditions, food source, habitat type, etc. And um, and so you have smaller number, I'm sorry, larger number of species inhabiting smaller niches, specialists.